Hello and welcome to a very brief lecture covering the Stonewall Riots and the move for LGBTQ rights. The Stonewall Riots, also called the Stonewall Uprising, began in the early hours of June the 28th, 1969, when New York City police raided the Stonewall Inn, which is a gay club located in Greenwich Village inside New York City. The raid sparked a riot among bar patrons and neighborhood residents as police roughly hauled employees and patrons out of the bar. This then led to six days of protests and violent clashes between law enforcement and LGBTQ activists. The Stonewall riot would serve as a catalyst for the gay rights movement in the United States and around the world. So I'm gonna look a little bit more specifically at what happened during these riots. All right, the 1960s and preceding decades, you could probably guess, were not a welcoming time for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, LGBT Americans. So for instance, solicitation of same-sex relationships was illegal in New York City, while it was not um, for opposite sex. So prostitution during this time period was technically legal as long as it was between a man and a woman. Now, for these reasons, because of the solicitation charges, LGBTQ individuals tended to flock to places where they would be welcome and where they wouldn't be subject to arrest. This included gay bars and clubs and places of refuge, more or less, where they could express themselves openly and socialize without worry. However, the New York State Liquor Authority penalized and shut down establishments that served alcohol to known or suspected LGBT individuals, arguing that the mere gathering of homosexuals was, by its very different definition, disorderly. Thanks to activist efforts, these regulations were overturned in 1966, and LGBT patrons could then be served alcohol. But engaging in gay behavior in public, you know, things like holding hands, kissing, dancing with someone of the same sex, was still considered illegal under New York law. So police harassment of gay bars continued, and many bars just operated without liquor license, in part because they were owned by the mafia. The first documented United States gay rights organization, the, human, the Society excuse me, for Human Rights, SHR, was founded in 1924 by Henry Gerber, who was a German immigrant. Police raids forced them to disband the organization, but not before they had published several issues of a newsletter that they titled Friendship and Freedom, which was the country's first gay interest newsletter. America's first lesbian rights organization, the Daughters of Bilitis, was formed in San Francisco in 1955. In 1966, three years before Stonewall, members of the Medicine Society, an organization dedicated to gay rights, staged what was called a sip-in, where they openly declared their sexuality at taverns, daring staff to turn them away, and then suing establishments who did. When the Commission on Human Rights ruled that gay individuals had the right to be served in bars, police raids were temporarily reduced. Now, the, one of the, the things that's not talked about a lot when you consider the Stonewall riots is that one of the organizations that's kind of working in the shadows behind all of this is the Mafia. The Mafia or crime syndicate controlled a lot of bars and clubs in New York, and it made a lot of money off of gay bars and clubs and establishments. It was more than happy to cater to the otherwise shunned gay clientele. There was one crime syndicate specifically, by the way, the Genoese, that controlled most Greenwich Village gay bars. And it was that syndicate, actually, that mafia family, who purchased the Stonewall Inn in 1966. It was a quote-unquote straight bar then. They converted it and reopened it the next year as a gay bar. Stonewall Inn was registered as a type of private bottle bar. It doesn't require a legal license because patrons were supposed to bring their own liquor with them. Club attendees had to sign their names in a book upon entry to maintain this sort of false idea of being this exclusive club. Now, would any of this worked in the light of day? No, of course not. But the Genoese family simply bribed New York's 
the police precinct in the area, it was the sixth precinct, to ignore the activities going on within the club. So you have the mafia bribing the police to turn the other way and not notice. Without police interference, the prime family could just you know, cut costs however they saw fit. And so as a result, there were some things that the Stonewall Inn didn't have because they didn't ever have to be inspected. So for example, the club didn't have a fire exit. Um, it didn't have running water behind the bar to wash glasses. It didn't have clean toilets that didn't routinely overflow. And it didn't have drinks that weren't watered down beyond recognition. And one of the major reasons that the mafia really, really liked running some of these clubs is that not only could they make profit off of selling the drinks and everything else that, that you make profit off of when you have a knife club, but they could also make profit because they could blackmail the club's wealthier patrons who wanted to keep their sexuality a secret. Despite all of this, Stonewall Inn quickly became an important Greenwich Village institution. It was large, it was cheap, and it also welcomed drag queens who were not accepted in other gay bars and clubs. It was also a home for many runaways and homeless gay youths who panhandled or shoplifted to get the entry fee. And it was actually one of the only, may actually have been the only, we're not certain on this, but it may have been the only gay bar that allowed dancing. I sure. The Stonewall Inn, like all of these other clubs, had to deal with police raids. Raids were just a fact of life. But usually different corrupt cops would just tip off the crime families before the raids occurred, and the owners could just stash the alcohol and move anything else that was illegal. In fact, the New York City Police Department had stormed Stonewall Inn just a few days before the riot-inducing raid that we'll talk about now. So the police raid the Stonewall Inn on the early morning hours of June the 28th, 1969. This time, no one tipped off the bar. Armed with a police warrant, officers entered the club. They roughed up the patrons. They found bootlegged alcohol. They arrested 13 people, including employees and people violating the state's gender-appropriate clothing statute. Uh, female officers would take um, cross-dressing patrons into the bathroom to check their sex. So now fed up with constant police harassment and discrimination, angry patrons and neighborhood residents just kind of spilled out into the street and an overwhelming protest broke out. At one point, things get violent. An officer hits a lesbian woman over the head as he tries to force her into the van. She shouts for others to act, which incites the crowd that starts to throw things at the police. Within a few minutes, a full-blown riot was going on involving hundreds of people. The police, now interestingly enough, including a few prisoners and one uh, writer by the Village Voice, a local newsletter, actually barricaded themselves inside the bar. So now you've got police barricaded inside the Stonewall Inn, and you've got patrons outside the Stonewall Inn, angry, throwing things, and keeping them locked in. The mob tried to storm into the barricade. So all the people outside tried to push their way in. They couldn't. And so then they tried to set the building on fire. The fire department and a riot squad were eventually able to douse the flame and rescue those inside Stonewall Inn. And they were able to disperse the crowd. But now these protests, sometimes involving thousands of people, continued in the area for five more days. Though the Stonewall uprising didn't necessarily start the gay rights movement. It's one of those galvanizing moments. It's one of those moments like the Selma March in the civil rights movement that everybody sees, everybody pays attention to, and it leads to an increase in activism amongst the LGBTQ community. They start new organizations, uh, most principally the Gay Liberation Front, they also start a human rights campaign, and they also form what's called GLAD, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. So all of these things 
come out as a result of the attention which is brought to these issues during the Stonewall riots. Again, they didn't necessarily start anything themselves per se, but at the same time, it was important because this proved to be a catalyst to get a movement going that may have otherwise taken a significant amount of time.